to do your spiel, you're good to go, Lisa. All right. Oh, there's Roger. Hi, Roger. Um, <laughs> hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, attending our Zoom presentation. This is our Immerse Yourself for July 2020. The History of Diving Museum opened up again um, in early June. While we were closed, of course, we put together our current featured exhibit, which is In-Depth 15 Years of the Diving Museum. It talks about what it took to create the museum, some of the changes over the last 15 years, and uh, it's really got a lot of great components to it. So we invite you to dive in on your next trip to Isla Morada. We want to thank you again all for participating. We also want to thank our sponsors tonight, the Misu family, who reside in Texas but they're proud supporters of the museum. They've been on the board for years. They um, have a lot of history that goes predates um, the, uh, the Bauer family and their uh, part of that. But anyway, we wanna thank the Missu family as their Mark V family membership and supporting our Immerse Yourself tonight. We also ha have the Blue Star program going on. It was kind of, put on hold through the National Endowment of the Arts, but through a generous uh, supporter, Liz Bone is one of our members. She's sponsoring it. So Blue Star is active military and up to five of their family members can come through the museum for free uh, between now and Labor Day. So if any of you are, again, know of any family members, any active duty, send them down to the museum and uh, they can see a lot of the uh, exhibits and things that we have to offer. Next, this weekend, we also are participating in the annual Patty Women's Dive Day. We've got a great Zoom presentation with maritime historian and underwater um, archeologist, Laurel Seaborn, and she's gonna be talking about seafaring women and um, early maritime archaeology. So that should be real exciting. You can go to our website, divingmuseum.org, get some more information about that. Next month's program on the third Wednesday of the month um, will be author, um, I don't know if you guys can see this, it's kind of dark in the library right now, but it's Quiet Strong is the story of Sherman Bird. He was the first African-American explosive ordnance disposal diver, and his daughter found out um, after the fact, after many years after he passed actually, and went back and got a lot of information. It's a really great um, story and information, and she'll be our speaker next month. So this month, that kind of brings you all up to date on what's been happening at the History of Diving Museum. Tonight we have Ted Hardy, who I've, I don't even know how long I've known you, Ted. We, we go times. way back. Um, he used to be a scuba instructor down at Tilden's in Marathon. Some of the, his students are on our Zoom presentation tonight. Yay. And then he got uh, introduced to free diving and got immersed <laughs> in free diving, free diving competitions, uh, went on to launch his own free diving um, courses and training and then after a couple of years of that and he'll be telling us more information but the real reason we're here tonight is to hear about the free diving safety course that he's put together and he was awarded a grant a, a because of the safety things that he's done in the industry and he immediately took that money and put it back into the industry to offer this free online program that he'll be telling us about tonight so that's very innovative and um it's it's so needed everybody one of the biggest problems with free diving is overconfidence i think ted will will go into more things but um you know you can never learn enough about safety and uh, he'll be talking to us about that. He also helped the History of Diving Museum put together a free diving exhibit a couple of years ago. And actually, we have some of his artifacts up on display. So we'll, we'll talk more about that in the wrap up. So I'm gonna turn it over to Emily. She'll give you the ins and outs of how tonight's gonna go, and then we'll hear from Ted. So thank you everybody for being with us. Okay, thank you, Lisa. So just a little bit of housekeeping before I head it over to Ted. Um, I, if you haven't done so already, 
Um, if you could please turn off your cameras and or mute yourself, that would be great. Um, I, if you do not, I will come and do it for you. Um, and don't worry about it. it's nothing personal or anything. It just helps with the recording and making everything go smoothly. Um, if anyone does have any questions so Ted can focus on his presentation, um, you can send them to me in the chat. And then at the end of the presentation, I will go through and um, ask Ted them myself and then he'll be able to answer them as well. And also towards the end, I'm going to send everyone a link to the website he's gonna be talking about that also has a fun little uh, discount with it as well. So keep that um, in the back of your mind and pay attention when I send that later. But other than that, I am going to hand it over to Ted and we will get started with the presentation. So let me get you squared away here. Just takes a second should have, okay, and then why aren't you letting me do this again? This was what happened earlier. <laughs> this, this was literally what happened earlier. And I'm putting up my scuba mom because my son is on the <laughs> <laughs> don't don't steal his the, <laughs> his spotlight. And why? All right. Else? All right. I think you should be able to get a uh, share now. So yeah, if you want to go ahead. Go. Yeah. So I'm just gonna go. We're all set. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, well, um, welcome everyone. Thank you for showing up. Uh, my name is Ted Hardy. I'm the founder of Immersion Freediving, as well as my new pride and joy, which is uh, freedivingsafety.com, which I'll be talking about uh, in a little bit. But basically, uh, I teach people to dive deeper, uh, stay longer, and become safer. Uh, so I'm super excited to be here. I wish, of course, I could be in the museum, <laughs> but I'm happy to at least be here uh, virtually. So this place always has a special place in my heart because I started my entire underwater career uh, in the Keys. Um, so I started in 2005. I graduated from Halls uh, as a scuba instructor, immediately went across the street uh, and started working at Tilden Scuba Center. And I did that from like 2005 to 2008. Uh, and I was very lucky that it, it was a very busy dive shop. I got to teach a lot of classes and that definitely laid the foundation and helped me immensely as I went on to, to get into free diving. Um, so I took my first free diving class in 2008 with performance freediving, um, uh, and it was with uh, Kirk and Mandy, and I took the freediving class, and that was it. Like I was, I loved it. I was blown away by the program. I was blown away by freediving. I came back to the Keys, and I'm like, okay, scuba's my job, but freediving is what I do on my day off, right? So when I had a day off, I didn't want to go scuba diving. I wanted to go freediving. I wanted to go spearfishing. I wanted to go training. I was obsessed with it, like typically what I am with everything. Um, but I, you know, I kept working at the Keys uh, at Tilden's, and then about a year later, performance freediving offered an instructor program. And so I'm like, oh, I can teach freediving instead of scuba. That's cool. So I went out and became a, a freediving instructor. There was like seven, eight people in the class. Two of us passed. They offered me a job on the spot, and I'm like, yes, sign me up. Right. So from that point, um, I moved to Fort Lauderdale working for performance freediving. And basically the way it worked back then was every weekend we would teach in a different city. So they would fly me down to, we'd do Key West one weekend, the next weekend we'd do Marathon, the next weekend we'd do, you know, Miami, then Fort Lauderdale, then California, then Hawaii, then Vancouver. And then we just crisscrossed all over the place. And I did that for about a year and a half. Loved it, learned a ton of stuff uh, working and, and, and working with them. And then around 2010, I started uh, immersion freediving where I was teaching PFI classes on my own. Uh, here in Fort Lauderdale. So um, I started doing that. Um, so I, you know, continued teaching. I worked my way up the PFI ladder. So just like scuba, you know, they've got all their different levels. Performance freediving is the same. Uh, you know, I worked my way up to the intermediate instructor, advanced instructor, and ultimately an instructor trainer uh, for performance freediving. I also got into the competitive side of freediving, right? So the question I always get asked is, how, you know, how, how, what's your deepest freedive and how long have you held your breath? So my deepest freedive is 279 feet. Uh, longest breath hold is seven minutes. Uh, I went on to break the longest standing U.S. freediving record at the time uh, for dynamic apnea, which is uh, distance at one breath in the pool, which was, I think it was 177 meters, um, 170 meters. Um, I was the captain of the U.S. freediving team uh, at, the, at the World Championships, and I've won a couple of uh, international freediving competitions. So I've been involved in the 
free diving side, you know, the instructional side, the competitive side for, for quite a while. Um, so the thing that I'm here to talk to you guys about, something I'm very passionate about, is free diving safety. Right? So the question I get asked a lot is, is free diving dangerous? Is free, you know, is free diving, is free diving dangerous? Is free diving spear fishing dangerous? And my response is always the same. Yeah, absolutely it is, especially the way most people do it, right? It's not dangerous the way I do it, <laughs> but it absolutely is dangerous the way most people do it. And why is that, right? And I think when you listen to this explanation, you'll see exactly why. Let's compare it to something that all of you in the Keys are infinitely familiar with, right? I mean, you guys are familiar with scuba and freediving, but, but scuba, right? You know you just can't walk into a dive shop and buy a bunch of scuba gear. You know you just can't walk on the dive boat and be like, yeah, hey, I want to go scuba diving. What are they going to ask you for? <laughs> no, no, you can't. You go have your card, right? You got to show them that you're certified. And what does that certification mean? Well, it means that you took a course from someone who's been vetted, right? And that person taught you the rules, the do's, the don'ts, how to put on the scuba gear, how to use the scuba gear. But more importantly, I would argue 50, 60, 70% of the scuba course is what to do when something goes wrong, what to do when your mass floods, what to do when your regulator comes out, what to do uh, if you, know, you run out of air but there's no one around you, what to do if, you need, if your buddy's having a problem, you need to push them back to the boat, what to do if your buddy runs out of air underwater, you gotta help them, what to do, right? All these different scenarios, right? If you think about what a scuba class actually does, me, the scuba instructor, takes you into the ocean, and I basically demand that you convince me that you can handle every single emergency situation that could possibly happen to you. I'm going to make you, you know, have that situation and you need to prove to me that if it happened, you'd be fine. And if you do all of that, out the door. Of course you can go scuba diving. I've verified that everything that can go wrong, you know how to handle. So yeah, of course you can go scuba diving. Well, let's compare that to free diving. Right? You walk into the dive shop and you're like, oh man, yeah, no fins. I want, no, I want the, the big ones. Like, give, me the, give me the big fins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The and I want the, the wetsuit. Yeah, no, no, no. no. I want the, the camo wetsuit with the hood and give me a little teeny tiny free diving mask and the, yeah, yeah, the snorkel, the camo snorkel and the, oh, the gun. Yeah, no, 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 not the big one. No, not too bad. I want the, the big one, right? And you buy all this gear, right? And you swipe your credit card. And that's it. It's up to you to figure out how to not hurt yourself. So, yeah. Of course, there's issues because the mo majority of people that participate in the sport of free diving have no formal training. They don't know the rules, they don't know the do's, they don't know the don'ts, they don't know what to do if someone has a problem. They don't, you know, when you compare it to scuba, it kind of makes, yeah, of course it makes sense that there's, there's issues in the sport. The sport is safe, right? I have a million dollar liability policy to teach these courses. Like I, I would not have one if what we were doing wasn't safe. They know that the way we do it is completely safe, right? So that's what I want you guys to understand today is you're going to understand some of the free diving, the do's, the don'ts, the rules and the procedures that you can implement the next time you got free diving, they'll absolutely make, make things safe. Um, so just to like, you know, bring this up, I mean, in the past week i've seen two spearfishing fatalities go across my facebook feed i know in the past week or two they've been several spearfishing fatalities um in hawaii right so you know to make this kind of sink home as to why you guys need to pay attention to this stuff you know there's probably 50 fatalities per year in the u.s for free diving there's almost all almost all of it is is you know breath hold spearfishing right so this is definitely something that uh you guys are going to want to pay attention to and the good news is i have never ever heard of a free diving splash beer fishing fatality where these rules that you're gonna learn were employed. Every time I hear about them, it's like, because well, none of the things were, were followed, right? So you're gonna learn uh, what those things are. So we're gonna go over some uh, the, the rules and procedures to keep you safe. You're gonna see a video of an actual uh, spear fishing, free diving spear fishing blackout. So you like see what it happens, see what it looks like. Uh, you're gonna learn how to tell if you're wearing too much weight when you're free diving in. You probably are. Um, and then I'm also going to 
tell you guys about freedivingsafety.com, which is, the, is a free online resource that you can use to get way more information than you can this presentation because I'm limited in time. Uh, but the, the website, uh, it's, again, it's a free online course and it's got very specific, way more than what you're gonna learn today just because I'm not restricted on time. And specifically, you're gonna learn the mechanics the, the, of how to do, if someone has a rescue, if someone has a lost motor trailer blackout, how those rescues work, right? And you're gonna see step-by-step -step breakdown of how all that stuff works, okay? Um, Free diving safety, uh, the way it came around, Lisa mentioned it, I, I, I'll just bring it up since she did. Um, I was at a trade show, uh, the, the Blue Wild, which is the largest free diving spear provision trade show in the US, and I won an award for my, uh, for promoting safety to specifically spear fishermen, right? And so they took me up stage, gave me a $2,000 check, uh, and then literally within a week, I had hired a web guy, and I hired two professional videographers to come to the house and film everything. And then I put up freedivingsafety.com. And the reason I did that is I've been teaching freediving for 10 years. Uh, and all the time I hear people say things like, Ted, I would love to take your class, but I can't get the time off work. I can't find someone to watch the kids. Can't, you know, can't get away from the wife, right? I can't afford it. All these things, right? Which are real things. And they can't take the course, therefore, and then they have no idea how to be safe. Right? So I don't like the idea that safety is hidden behind this expensive paywall of a freediving class. The way I look at it is, if you are interested in learning how to be safe, I, that's, all, that's all I need. If, that's, if you're interested, boom, I want you to have all of that information, right? So the, the website contains all the information that you learn if you came to my house, which would be, be right there in that room, and then I'd be teaching you, but all, it's all the same, right? So I definitely uh, encourage anyone to go to that, uh, the website and learn everything you can about safety. All right, so. Um, you're going to notice that I would be talking about spearfishing a lot. Now, the idea is, I don't, you know, whether you're free diving for spearfishing, whether you're, you know, just going for fun off the reef, whether you're a photographer, underwater basket weaver, underwater meditator, I don't care what you do. Free diving principles are the same no matter what it is that you do. So yes, I'm going to be referencing this to spearfishing a lot because I know this is in the keys and I know most of you guys are spearfishing. But if you're watching this and you're like, well, I don't spearfish, it applies. It's all the same. Safe free diving is the same no matter what it is you're doing underwater. Okay, so let's take a look at typical spearfishing trip. All right, typical spearfishing trip goes something like this. Everyone piles on the boat, right? Go out to your super secret spot. As soon as you get there, you take the anchor, throw the anchor overboard, and before the anchor hits the bottom, everyone jumps off the boat with first in, first fish. This guy goes that way, this guy goes that way, this guy goes that way, and just everyone scatters, right? right? And then I come along. And I'm like, hey, what about the what about the what about the buddy system? Like, aren't you? And he's like, oh yeah, yeah no, 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 no. I got, I got, I got. Uh, uh, John, yeah, John's over there. Yeah, yeah, he's right there. Yeah, he's, he's, he's I was watching. And then my cousin, uh, uh Bill, he's uh, where is he? Uh, he always comes up with big group. He's oh yeah, he's over there. Yeah, and then I've got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all watching each other. We got like four eyeballs on each other. That's way better than your little buddy system, right? That, unfortunately, is pretty normal is what happens in, in, in a spearfishing trip. And that, the fact that that is normal is why we have the fatality rates that we have, right? I will tell you, I've been telling that same story for 10 years when I, when I do any presentation. It's got a little better in the past 10 years. It's a little better, right? There's pockets of areas where people are actually do, diving in teams and all that sort of stuff. And it is getting better, which is not where we need to be. But also in the past 10 years, there have been so many free diving instructors out there, you know, preaching safety and all that sort of stuff. So it is cool. I see we're making some progress. We're just not where we need to be. All right. So basic free diving fundamentals, right, that you need to understand. Um, I know as an instructor that's been teaching for 10, 15 years, scuba and free diving, is I know that you're going to do a much better job if you understand why it is I'm telling you this stuff. Or if I just say like, do this, this, and this, but I don't spend the time to explain why, then people tend to not get engaged. So I definitely wanna explain why all this stuff is. So the first thing that I like to start with is something that most pre-divers, pre-divers really don't, aren't aware of, right? Maybe unless they've taken a formal program. Um, and that is what we call the rule of nines. So the rule of nines states this, right? It's pretty simple. It says that 90%, 90% of the hypoxic issues, right? The hypoxic issue is going to be what we call a loss of motor control or a blackout, right? So blackout, you're probably familiar with. It's when you black out, you lose, you lose consciousness, right? Um, unfortunately, because most spear fishermen are overweighted, when they black out, they sink down to the bottom of the ocean. 
the fact that the average buddy is 50 feet away from that guy trying to shoot a bigger fish than that guy, not right on top of him watching him, is why we have so many bad outcomes in the sport, right? So blackout is you lose consciousness, and depending on how you're weighted, you may or may not sink. Um, but most people overweight it so they do sink and their body gets far away and this is why we have problems. Um, a loss of motor control is not a blackout. Um, it's a situation where you're hypoxic, right? And then you hit the surface and you maybe take a breath or two and then you start having a, what we call a loss of motor control, right? And you're trying to give the person the okay sign but you're shaking it around, right? <laughs> you're having a hard time breathing, right? That's what we call a loss of motor control. Now, Here's what's surprising to most people. 90% of the hypoxic issues, loss of motor control, blackout, happen at the surface. So they hit the surface, they take one breath and they're fine. They take a second breath and they're fine. And then by the time they take their third breath and they give the okay sign, that's when they start to have a problem and they go out. 90% of the problems. One breath, fine. Second breath, fine. Give you the okay sign, and then they go out. Most people don't know that or expect that, right? You know, so that's the thing is most of the problems happen right when you get to the service. That's why it's so critical that we have someone there we call close enough to grab watching you, okay? Um, so we know that 90% of the problems happen at the surface. We say 9% of the problems happen in that, that last 15 feet, right? So that last 15 feet to the surface. So in essence, 99% of the problems are gonna happen within that top 15 foot, right? And 15 foot, I mean, that's like your swimming pool is like 12 foot deep. So basically swimming pool depth, right? So these issues are very easy to handle, assuming you're doing the things that I'm gonna be talking about, All right? So we understand the rule of nines, 9%. 90% of the issues happen at the surface, 9% the last 15 feet. So knowing that, what do we have to do? Well, you as a buddy have to be what we call close enough to grab. You need to be, when that person hits the surface, you need to be within arm's reach of that person, you know, three foot, right? So that if that person had a problem, you could grab them. And that's it, right? Now, if you, you know, if you have 50 foot long arms, then yeah, you can be 50 foot away from the person, right? But human beings, we got, you know, arms are this big, right? You know, that's, that's about three feet on either side. So that's why we have to be close enough, right? Because think about it. I know, I mean, so it's, if you're a free dive, if you're a spearfish, and how many times have you hit the surface and your buddy is not right here within this distance? Unfortunately, that's pretty common among spear fishermen, right? You know, they're, they're 30, 40, yeah, 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 you know, they're, they're keeping an eye, oh, yeah, 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 you see him, he's over there, right? You know, yeah, yeah, you're good, right? But if, that per if you're 30 foot away, 50 foot away, and that person blacks out and starts sinking underwater, do you know how long it takes to swim, swim over to where that person is, right? All right, so here's the a story um, I, I, uh, for Sherry Day. So Sherry Day, I mean, you may or may not know, is a very accomplished beer fisherman. Uh, she runs the, the Blue Wild every year. Um, she's gone through the PFI program, I think, three times. I had the pleasure of teaching her uh, once. Um, I'm not, I don't get nervous when I teach, um, but that was probably the only time I've ever been nervous teaching a freediving class, and it was because um, Kirk, who run performance freediving at the time, that was the first time he ever said, you know what, Ted? The first day, I'm not even going to show up. You just take care of everything. Like, I'm just going to show up, you know, because he was trying to, like, groom me to be able to run the programs on my own. And so he let me, I'm like, all right, I can handle it. I can do everything on my own. Like, fine, Kirk, you just come the second day of school. And then who shows up to class? Sherry Day. She's taken the course twice from Kirk. And I'm like, oh, crap. Right? Because if I don't do it right, she's going to know she already went through the course. Right? So I was, funny, I was actually pretty nervous about that. But um, course went well. But Sherry will tell you. Um, so Sherry was out spearfishing, uh, this was, you know, a long time ago, um, but she was out spearfishing with four or five guys, right? So, you know, these guys had even more experience than she had, lots of experience in the water, um, and she had taken the program. So she's like, she's trying to do what she's supposed to do, which is be close enough to grab. But if you've got one person who's trying to be safe, and you've got five other spearfishermen, is there any possible way Sherry can do that properly? 
I mean, she would have to, even if she put her gun on the boat and just spent her whole time flitting around on the surface trying to be close enough to people, I mean, you, 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 one person can't do that correctly, right? So she was just doing the best job she could. And so she's safety and the people, you know, trying to, to, you know, do the best job she can. And these people are not used to that. So she's literally, when they hit the surface, she's right there, like, you know, watching them. And they're like, the hell are you doing? Watching me, like, <laughs> what are you doing, right? And it, so it started to, you know, create this little bit of a, issue right because they weren't used to it and they didn't need to be watched and they didn't need to be watched by a woman right a female so it was all creating a little bit of a, a a problem and she was just trying to do the right thing so one of the things so the guy comes up she's right there and you know she's like you know what these guys are fine they, they've been doing this so longer than me like i don't need to worry about it i'm just going to give them some space uh and so you know she's like they're fine and she starts to swim away from the guy so then as she's swimming away Remember the old cartoon, the, the devil and the angel, right? So she, she had taken the course from Kirk and she's swimming away and she hears Kirk on her, on her shoulder say, close enough to grab, watch for 30 seconds. And then the other one's like, ah, they're fine. They're fine. You don't need to worry about it. They're, they're, they're good. Just, you know, they don't need to worry about it. No, you're supposed to watch for no less than 30 seconds. You're supposed to be close enough to grab. And so they're arguing. And then finally she's like, you know what? I'm supposed to do the right thing. I need to be watching them. She turns around and she looks at the guy and she sees, he blacks out, and because he's a way spear fisherman, down he goes, right? He's sinking, right? So at this point, she's 30 feet away from him. You know how long it takes to swim 30 foot in the ocean, right? So this guy's sinking, right? So then she swims over, right? And now, and we'll also think about this, what happens to the speed of that person sinking, right? The deeper they get, the more air they let out, the more compressed they are, the faster the sink gets, right? So she gets on top of him, and can she just immediately dive and go get him? No, because she just, she just she's freaking out. Her friend is sinking to the bottom of the ocean. So she sprints over there, right? And then when she gets to where she's supposed to go, she can't dive because she's, her heart rate's too high. So she's, you know, she's trying to like catch her breath and then, you know, goes down, dives down, grabs this person, right? She'd been trained in free diving rest. So she was asked what to do, brought the guy up and the guy was fine. But she'll tell you that she almost couldn't get to that guy, right? And she's probably a better diver than the people watching this, right? And it's all because she was 30 foot away, right? So that's the thing, right? Everyone thinks like, oh, you're watching and it's cool. But when things go wrong, you need to be close enough to grab, right? I mean, imagine how simple that would be if that person had blacked out and she was like, whoop, and just grabbed the person. It's very simple to fix, right? Put them on the back, take the mask off, blow across the eyes, and they're going to be good, right? So... You, you need to be close enough to grab, okay? That's why we wouldn't need to be so close, right? You, you, when you're diving with people, that's what you want. That's what a good buddy is because that's, you know, your buddy's going to take care of you, right? That if something goes wrong, that they're going to be there for you, right? So not only do we got, we know about the rule of nines. We want to be close enough to grab and we want to watch for no less than 30 seconds, right? So the idea is most of the blackouts are going to happen, right? Because the rule of nines, we want to be there within 30 seconds. So the idea is if someone comes up and they're giving me the okay sign and they're good, I'm not going to be like, all right, good. I'm out of here. See you. Right? So my students know when, when students come up on the rig, they can say that they're good and I'm going to be watching them for 30 seconds. Other student might be asking me a question. Hey, Ted. And I'm like, no, 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 no. And then once I have seen that that student has been breathing for 30 seconds and they're good, then I will turn my back on that student and I'll answer whatever questions this guy has, right? Because I know after 30 seconds of breathing, right, you, you, you're not going to be hypoxic, right? But that's the thing. So we want to be close enough to grab and we want to watch for no less than 30 seconds, okay? Now, let's put this into spearfishing terms, right? I very specifically remember taking the free diving class in Miami, I went down to the Keys, and then I started spearfishing. Me and my buddy both took the course. And what happened is, I would come up, and my buddy wouldn't be there, and we, were, we, we had said we were gonna watch each other, right? And then the guy come up, and the buddy's not there, and I'm hollering, right? And we're always, I'm like, you're, how are you doing? You're supposed to be over here, right? And she's like, no, 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 you're supposed to be watching. You know, we're just hollering at each other, because we can't like keep, keep it sorted, right? So. It's very hard to keep that buddy system. 
but there is a very simple way to make it work. And this is what I call my bulletproof buddy system. And I used to teach this exact same thing on scuba. It's no different than scuba, right? So on scuba, I, I would very often get the unhappy husband and wife, right? And they're on the boat saying, we need to take a navigation course because we always get lost and she always takes off. And like, they're like, you know, I'm trying to like, you know, fix this issue with this angry couple that always gets separated. And they're like, well, we need to take a navigate. I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't need to take a navigation. I can fix this in 20 seconds. And they're always like, what? I'm like, okay, let me ask you a question. You guys are arguing because you get separated, right? Yeah. And then they start pointing fingers. Like, He's got a camera. And blah, blah, blah. Right? So I say, all right, look, here's the thing. When you guys jumped in the water, which one of you was designated the leader and which one of you is designated the follower? And every time I ask that question, I always get, uh, I'm like, exactly. That's why you get separated, right? So the way it works for spear fishing is two of you jump in the water. One is designated a leader, one is designated the follower. The rules are is this, the leader gets to go wherever they want. The follower has no say in the matter. Follower keeps his mouth shut, follows fin tips. All he does is just follow those fin tips, right? Just follow those fin tips around. When the leader wants to make a dive, he doesn't have to say, hey, 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 hey make sure you're watching me, I'm gonna go dive. This. No, because the follower is gonna do that, right? So the leader goes wherever he wants, follower's just following. As soon as that person makes a dive, comes up, that person's right there, close enough to grab, watches for 30 seconds, and then we switch roles. No communication needed, no screaming, no hollering. Now that person is the leader. And if he wants to go the opposite direction, fine. That leader, she takes off this way, and then the follower follows that person, right? And you just go back and forth, right? Always one up, one down, right? Leader, follower, role. It works so well, and it's easy. Once you get in that rhythm, it just works, right? And so it's very easy to do something like that, right? So that's what I call a bulletproof buddy system. Now, a very critical thing in free diving is most free divers are overweight. That means if you're free diving, you're probably overweight, right? Because almost everyone is overweight. When, my, when students come into my course, it is 10, 15% of the people are weighted properly. So that means 80, 90% of the students that come in are overweighted, right? And they have all sorts of things about how they say, well, if I do this and I'm, you know, well, because I, I weigh this much, you divide by four and they have all these crazy things. Okay. I'm going to teach you a very simple, simple thing that you can do literally the next time you jump in the water that will precisely tell you if you're wearing too much weight, Okay. I, I teach my students to do this every single time they jump off the boat, right? And you should do this too. So the idea is when someone has a blackout, if you black out, you don't hold your breath when you black out. The first thing that happens when you black out is you do what's called a relaxed exhalation. You go, you're going to let out some of that air, but you're going to let out a very particular precise amount of air. So everyone do this with me. Everyone take a big breath in and do relax exhalation like a sigh, right? That passive exhale like a sigh. That is precisely the exact amount of air you would let out if you blacked out, right? You're not gonna black out and go, and push out every ounce of air because you're unconscious. You're not gonna actively do that. You're gonna do a passive exhalation, okay? Remember I talked about it earlier, the biggest problem with free diving and spear fishing is if someone blacks out, they're typically overweighted, and so they sink to the bottom of the ocean. And where is their buddy? Their buddy is typically 50 feet down the reef trying to shoot a bigger fish than them because they're competing to see who can shoot the bigger fish, right? So where would be a better place to end up than on the bottom of the ocean if you were to black out? Yeah, floating on the surface. A <laughs> much better place, right? So think about it. Think about what you've just learned. How could you jump into the water and tell where you would end up if you were to black out? Well, you would simulate a blackout. So you would jump in the water wearing a wetsuit and weight belt, whatever you normally wear, you take a big breath in, and then you do relaxation like a sigh. Don't move your hands, don't kick your feet, and see what happens. You're probably gonna sink. If you're sinking, that means if you were to black out, you would sink, right? That's a problem, right? So you wanna be able, that's what I call the surface exhalation, the surface safety test. You want to be able to do a relaxed exhalation and not sink. So if you fail that test, which you're probably gonna take a pound off, try it again. Take a pound off, try it again. Take a pound off, try it again, right? And you want to make it so when you do that relaxed exhalation, you're not 
thinking, okay? That is one of the most important things you can do, right? Now, understand that if you do that test and you figure out how much you need, that changes. The minute you change your wetsuit, if you go to the springs and it's fresh rather than salt water, you can't do that once and think like three years later it's the same. You might have gained weight, you might have lost weight, you might have put on some muscle, right? It's all going to change. When you change that wetsuit, it's going to change. You change from a, a full to just a shorty. Every, anything that you do changes. Wetsuits get more compressed over time, so you lose buoyancy that way. So that, that is a test. Every time you jump in the water, relax exhalation, make sure you're good. Now, wetsuits are not just for warmth. They're for safety. I see people all the time, Ted, I'm not overweight and I'm only wearing a pound. I can't be overweight. I'm wearing one, 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 one pound, Ted. I'm not overweight. Okay, jump in the water, do relax exhalation like a sigh, you sink. You're overweighted. But it's only a pound. Take the pound off. So now they're wearing, they're wearing no wetsuit, no weight belt, and they do a relaxed exhalation and they still sink. And they're like, I can't be overweighted. I'm like, you just proved that you're overweighted. You're gonna sink if you black out because wetsuits, if you're like super fit, like no body fat, super in shape, you're gonna need to wear a wetsuit just for buoyancy, not necessarily for work. Now, me, who has a body built by Bear Bird and Barbecue, if I jump in that water with no wetsuit on, I'm gonna float just fine, right? But a lot of my students, a lot of spear fishermen, super fit, right, you know, no body fat, you need a wetsuit, not for warmth, but for safety. It's crazy to be free diving or spear fishing, knowing that you're going to sink if you black out. Right? So that's why we want to be aware of that. Okay, so the other thing I get all the time, Ted, I appreciate all the safety stuff you do. I mean, my kids absolutely definitely got to get them on board with that. But, you know, I don't push myself. I know my limits. You know, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm in tune with my body, right? I can't tell you how many hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of times I hear that, right? I'm in tune with myself. I don't push myself. I know my limits, right? Okay, so here's what's important to understand. On a dive in the ocean, so you're out spearfishing, if you were to come up from a dive, and that dive, let's say, would result in a blackout, right? So you're coming up from a dive, this is a fictitious dive, this person comes up from a dive, and the end result of that dive is they're gonna hit the surface and they're gonna black out. All right, so the question is, what would you feel on that dive? More than likely, you would feel fine. You would feel nothing is wrong. You wouldn't feel the slightest thing wrong, right? Why do I know that? Well, because one, I've talked to tons of people that have had blackouts and they say, I feel fine. Secondly, if I had 30 minutes, I could prove through physiology and the hemoglobin association curve and partial practice of oxygen and all this sort of stuff that I get super excited about. Most people probably don't, but I can prove via physics and physiology that you wouldn't feel that anything is wrong, right? Now, I remember when I took this free diving class and Kirk's telling me that, well, if you were to black out on a, coming up from a dive, you'd probably feel fine. You wouldn't even know anything's wrong. I'm like, I don't believe, I would, I would, I would know, right? I, I'm not an idiot. I would know, right? So um, I'm going to show you video footage, right? So I'm telling you from talking to people that have had it happen, I've, I've had um, that it happen, uh, not in the ocean, but I mean, the idea is I'm going to show you video of it. And you're going to see with your own eyeballs, right? And so what we're going to do right now is I'm going to show this video. I want everyone to just take a look at this. Let me set this video up. This is of a, a, a 25 years experienced spear fisherman. I uh, spear fishing with two good friends of mine, Rashley, uh, in, Rashley, Ren and Ashley of Evolve Free Diving. This person's got about, I said, 20, 25 years of spear fishing experience. This person, uh, so they came out with Ren and Ashley, and Ren and Ashley had just become free diving instructors. And so they said, hey, uh, if you're going to come dive with us, Here's the deal. You got to be, if you dive in, you know, we, we dive in teams, one up, one down. Uh, you can't be, you know, I definitely look at your weight, but you're definitely wearing too much weight. Um, and so we kind of told him the rules. And he was like, look, I've been doing this for longer than you've been walking on this earth, man. I've never had a problem. Like, I'm fine. Right. So they take him out. Um, he's spearfishing at 50 feet, which is the depth that he always spearfishes at. This isn't like some, you know, wow, he was diving 30 feet deeper than he ever has before. He, he always dives at this depth. This is at, totally inside his wheelhouse. He did seven dives on this exact same spot 
And then this happened, right? So let me bear with me. Uh, all right, so if you guys can put screen sharing up for me and let me know when that's done, uh, we'll come back to that as I tried to share that and was not able to. Um, if you can just let me know somehow when that is available. So we'll come back to that. Um, all right, so another thing, um, well, I mean, let's talk about the typical spear vision fatality, right? So they're typically all the same, right? Person makes a drop, got some time on the bottom, works its way to the surface, hits the surface. What happens at the surface? Well, where do, where do most of the problems happen? The surface after what? Two to three breaths, right? So the spear vision hits the surface, takes a couple of breaths, and then blacks out, right? Because they're overweighted and their buddy is 50 feet down the reef, that means they sink down. Right, so they start sinking down and then they come to for a little bit and they're able to make it up a little bit and they have a secondary blackout and then we find the person on the bottom gun nearby right so what did we used to think we we, we see this we see the spear fish on the bottom gun nearby and they would say oh he must have had a deep water blackout right that's what they said for years and we've always said no 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 he didn't black it down there he made it to the surface but it wasn't until we started to have dive computers right that we could actually prove that he actually made it to the surface and then sunk down right so what would prevent that from happening? Very simple, buddy at the surface, right? But the buddy's not close enough to grab, he's 50 feet down the reef trying to shoot a bigger fish than the guy, right? Because they're in a competition. Um, so what happens is, I told you the, 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 the person will black out and they come to, and you'll see like they make it up a little bit and they black out and they go back down. So the question is what causes that? And here's why, this is interesting. One of the questions I get a lot is Ted, you know, hopefully I get to show you the videos, but in a free diving class, I'll be showing you all these videos. One of the things, the questions I get is they're like, Ted, you keep showing these people having these hypoxic issues, lost motorly spear vision, having problems at the surface, but they're breathing. Like, why would they have, they're breathing air. Like how would they, how do you black out as you breathe? That makes no sense, right? And that's a very good question. How is it that as you're breathing, you're then still going out? Because this is all about oxygen, right? They're getting oxygen. So here's the question. Here's the question for you. When I take a breath, where is that oxygen? Right then. Is it magically in my brain as soon as I take a breath? No, where is it? It's in my lungs. It's in the, it's in the air sacs of my lungs. Then it goes in the, the alveoli and then that oxygen transfers through that cell, the, that membrane and then it's in the capillaries in the blood. Then it's in the, the, the blood vessels in my lungs. Then my heart has to beat about 20 times to make that oxygen rich blood go to the brain. So it takes a long time to get that oxygen from here into the brain. That's why you get and then and then they're going out, right? Okay, so thank you. Uh, so there's that delay, right? So what happens in this, in this example, I said the person blacked out and then comes to, they black out, they hit the surface, they take two or three breaths, they black out, they sink down, and then those two or three breaths that they took at the surface hit the brain. And that's when they come to for a little bit, they come to for about two to three breaths worth, they maybe claw up to the surface and they don't make it, and that's why they have a secondary blackout. I have had, believe it or not, two students, before they came to my free diving class, both of them were solo kayak spearfishing that said they had blacked out, sunk underwater, came to underwater, and were able to hook their arms on the, the, the kayak before they went back out again, right? I mean, talk about like as close as it can be. That's just pretty close. All right, so now I'm gonna show you this video so you guys can see what it is I'm talking about. All right, so this is the video. Uh, all right. All right, so let's back up so if you can see this. All right, so this is a 50 foot, right? He's spearfishing around 50 feet, takes a shot, goes over, secures the fish. Now he's making it up to the surface. So he's about 50 foot. Everything looks totally normal. Now, when I look at his kick right now, I can see his kick is very weak. He's not going anywhere. Right, and then he's almost barely moving. Now we see release of air, which is the sign of the blackout, and look where he's going. He's sinking underwater. He's sinking down, right? So again, watch again, right? He gets near the surface. He's right, he's about 10 feet from the surface. He blacks out, and then he's sinking underwater, right? 
So let me get back to normal. Okay, so again, this guy has 20, 25 years of spearfishing experience. He's never had a problem before. He always dives at that depth. He did seven dives before that last one. And he had that problem. He admits he, he typically dies by himself. Now, obviously the guy's fine because my buddy Ren was there. He's a free diving instructor. He knows what to do. The guy was fine, right? But when they get him back on the boat, you know, the reality starts to sink in. The reality is this. If you've been spearfishing for 20, 25 years, first thing we got to do is we got to figure out how many individual drops has you made over, over, over 20, 25 years. It's a lot, right? That's a lot of, lot of drops. I mean, I make 60 drops in a, in a class, right? And he's been doing it for 20, 25 years. So, I mean, I don't think it's unreasonable to say he's done 10,000 individual dives, right? So here are his stats. He's done 10,000 dives. He's had one problem out of 10,000 particular dives, right? So if that blackout had happened on any of the 999,999 other dives, he would be dead because he by, by himself or there's no one watching him, right? So here's the question. When you watched that video, where was the point where he asked for help? Did you see when he was like, oh my God, get me out of here? And why is that? Because he felt fine. You talk to the guy, he'll tell you. He felt fine, right? You saw it with your own eyeballs. He felt fine. But what does everyone tell me? Ted, I appreciate all the safety stuff you do with my kids. Absolutely, I'm going to make them do that. But I, you know, I'm in tune with my body. I don't, I don't, I don't push myself. I, I, I know my limits. Okay, the facts are, due to physiology, that's just not true. Under most circumstances, you'll feel fine. You just saw with your own eyeballs. Clearly, that guy felt fine. He wasn't asking for help. Ren was right there. If he had a problem, he would have asked for Ren, right? So it's why it's so critical that we dive in teams, one up, one down, close enough to grab, right? You just got to, right? Um, so there are a couple other, other things I'll mention. Um, I, I've been given this field for my free diving classes at Spear Vision forever. And I always joke that like, I, I set a pretty good argument, I think of why it's in your interest to dive safely because you know, you don't die. I, I think that's a pretty good argument. I've found over the years, that's not a good argument. They, they, they don't, it doesn't change their behavior. So now I add on to the fact that let's discuss how hunting in teams is gonna put more fish in the cooler, right? Because if I can convince you of that, then they're like, oh, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe I will dive in teams. If you can put, we can put more fish in the box. And that's not the point of spearfishing, I don't know what it is, right? So let me go over a couple of scenarios. Scenario number one, you're by yourself. When I say by yourself, I don't mean you, you drove out and you jumped off the boat and there's no one you're just by yourself. I mean, you're doing what a lot of people do is three people jump off the boat, but they're all in different directions, which is basically no one's watching anyone, right? So that's what I mean when I say you're by yourself, right? So you make a drop, you know, you, you're cruising on, you take a shot at a fish, and it tears off, right? It's not a holding shot. So now you've got to go to the surface. And now you've got an issue. You want to get a second shaft in that fish as quickly as possible. Now, if you've ever, you know, had this happen, I mean, maybe you always stone your fish and this never happened before, but most people, this has happened. Now the thing is you are forced to get down there as fast as you can, which means you're probably going to be doing what's called hyperventilating, which is doing heavy breathing, right? If you don't know, hyperventilating, heavy breathing like that increases the risk of a blackout, right? So now you're trying to get, so you can get down there and get a second shot in that fish. And when you go down that second dive, it's gonna be nowhere as long as that first dive because you're rushed, right? So here's the question. What is more likely to get that fish in the cooler? If you come up to the surface, have to hyperventilate and try to get down on a limited dive, or your buddy who's at the surface, who's totally breathed up, he go puts a second shaft in it. Which is more likely to put the fish in the cooler? I've never had a student say the first way. They always go the second way. Yeah, right? So this is different. This is, and then you get a fight over whose fish it is and you guys sort that one out, okay? Another example, this one happens. You make a drop. A cruise along the bottom, you're at the end of your dive. You're like, yeah, I need to go up. And you start to go up and you make two kicks, three kicks, and then, right? You, you, see the, you, you see the snapper, but you're already, you know, okay, let's say five, anyway, you're all the way up, and so you can't, you, you can't make a shot up. So now you're at the surface, right? Now, 
same dilemma. It's you notice so, I, so in the story, it's a mangrove snapper, right? If it was a hogfish, you know, whatever, go on the boat, have a sandwich, come back, get a plastic fork, you can get it. I didn't. I always said mangrove snapper, right? Which as you know is a tricky fish to get. Um, and so if you're by yourself, if you try to get back down there again fast, right? Hyperventilating shorter time you're not gonna have the time you need to get that mangrove snapper, right? Because if you know anything about mangrove snapper, you don't get it by sprinting at it with the gun, right? You need to be very cautious and very stealthy. So the, the issue is, if you just saw that mangrove snapper and you hit the surface, what's more likely for you to land it? For you to try to rush back down and get it yourself? Or say, hey, Jeremy, where the coral head was, there's a mangrove, go get it. Which more likely where the fish gonna end up in the box? The second way. But this is a complete shift in mentality because now you're hunting as a team not hunting is individuals fighting against each other, right? Because that's typically what happens, right? It's who's gonna shoot the bigger fish? Who's gonna shoot the most fish, right? And so that competitive mentality, which is very alive in spearfishing, is what breeds the anti-safety part, right? I mean, I always joke like the spearfish will get in the water and like, you know, he goes to his spot and he's like, all right, this spot right here, this is where all the big fish are. You go way the hell over there where the tiny fish are. This is all, this whole thing is mine, right? They don't want people on their spots, right? But if you would look at cooperating, you'll do better. I'll give you another example. Uh, Bahamas, right? Where is a place where they, they're pretty good about hunting in teams? It's the Bahamas. And it's not because of they're so worried about blackout. I mean, I hope it is. But what are they worried about? They're worried about sharks, right? So they know it's in their interest to have teams, right? So let's say you've got a grouper, you know, you're at 50 foot and one of those groupers is up under those rocks and you've got your head on the rock and you're trying to deal this thing out and there's sharks around. The smart dive team will put a second guy down just to like, bend off where the other guy's behind got his head up the rock, right? So they're doing in teams just to like do prevention, right? right? So, but this is just a different mentality. It's, 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 and you know, then when you get back to the dock, the, the, the team gets fish, right? And so I had a student be like, share the fish, you're a communist, like this is my fish, right? And I understand that's the way most people do it and you mark in your fish and this is, you know, you put the marks on it so you know that this is, you know, that's my 18 inch one, yours is the 16 inch one, right? And you do whatever you want. But I will tell you, Jeremy Gamble, the owner of Spearing Magazine, I have him on video saying, after I took Ted's class and we went back and we started hunting in three-person teams, he goes, absolutely. We immediately started putting more fish in the cooler, right? So that's not me saying that, that's saying the owner. And I have so many of my students that exclusively hunt in these three-person teams. You get more fish. And so focus on the fact that you get more fish and you get this little insignificant bonus of not dying, but I know no one cares about that. Just focus on the fact that you're going to get more fish. All right. Um, all right. So review the rules. One up, one down, right? When one person's on the surface, the other person's down, right? When that person is the surface, then you can switch. Three person teams better. That's the best way to do it for spearfishing. Now you've got one person down. When this person hits the surface, you've got this guy that's the safety. And the third guy is breathed up and he can immediately make a drop. So if you've got a three person team, you've always got someone on the bottom covering ground. You've always got someone that can go put a second shaft in that fish that's ready, right? So the way Jeremy does it, when he comes up from the surface, he's got a safety and then he's got his third guy who's ready to dive. And if he goes like that, that means I need a second shaft in that fish and that guy can tear off and go put a second shaft, right? Again, this is hunting as a group, right? Um, so we want to be one up, one down. We want to be close enough to grab. We want to be watching for no less than 30 seconds. We want to make sure we're not overweighted. The way that you tell that you're not overweighted is you jump into the water, wearing your wetsuit, your weight belt, whatever it is you're wearing, big breath in, relax, exhale like a sigh all at once. Don't move your hands, don't move your feet, and see if you float or sink. If you sink, you're overweighted, you need to take a pound off and do it again, okay? Um, as I said, freedivingsafety.com goes into way more of this stuff, right? So what we'll do right now is I'm gonna ask some of you guys questions, and I'm also gonna let you know, um, I've got a, um, another website that we'll put up in the chat in just a second um, that hosts all of my online classes, right? So freedivingsafety.com, you can go there, that's free, right? The other website I have has all sorts of courses. I've got a course on equalizing. If you're a free diver and you're struggling to equalize your ears in the 15 to 40 foot range, which is very common, I've got a course that deals with that. I've got a course, people that are interested in free diving called Breath Hold Secrets, right? That goes over the, the, the tips to increase your breath hold. And, and to be honest, the secret to holding your breath is not what you do during the breath hold, it's what you do before the breath hold, right? So it teaches you how to prepare for the breath hold. Um, I've got my kind of all inclusive course. If you want to go all in everything, is I've got a 28 day free diving transformation program, which gives you a 28 day 
free diving specific workout, which you can do at home, right? It's all designed at home. You're gonna learn the five most effective dry land free, life, free diving exercises that I know of, right? You get the calendar to print out, you stick it on your refrigerator. I'm gonna tell you what to do on each day, take certain days off. Um, and then there's a private Facebook group where you can ask me questions and the students post their workouts, right? But there's a, a link there, it should be in the chat box. If you use the discount code history of diving, 25% off all of those online classes, right? So if there's any questions, let's put them in the chat. I'll answer those. I don't know how, if there are any questions, let me know. Okay, um, Ted, it's Emily. I've got one from Elena. What are the health prerequisites for free diving? Yeah, that's good. So just like scuba, you're gonna have to get a diver medical. If you just, if you take any scuba course, you're gonna have to get a diver medical. And it's very similar, right? It's gonna, you know, basically the thing is, if I'm a scuba instructor, if I'm a free diving instructor, I'm not a doctor, right? You might have some medical condition. I don't know if it's the problem with free diving or not. So you take any of those courses, they're gonna ask you things like, do you have asthma, do you have diabetes? Do you have any medical conditions? Are you on prescription medication? All these things. And if you answer any of those, yes, that doesn't mean you can't free dive. It just means you need to go to a doctor and a doctor, not me, needs to say, yes, that's, a, that's not a problem with free diving, right? Or that's not a problem with scuba diving. It's not a problem. And then they sign it and then you can go do it, right? So what I would say outside of that kind of medical things, you want to be, um, you want to be, you don't need to be an Olympic athlete, right? But you need to be in, in, you need to be in decent shape, right? I mean, free diving class, you're in the water all day, right? I mean, so I say like, you know, you don't need to be an Olympic athlete. I've got plenty of students that, that are not in amazing shape to do very well free diving, but you need to be able to be active, right? Um, because it's an, it's an active sport. Um, you, you also want to be comfortable in the water. Do not take a free diving class to get over your fear of the water. That is not a good idea, right? If you, you know, it's a, you need to be a competent swimmer. If swimming makes you uncomfortable, do not take a free diving course. Take a swimming course and then come take the free diving course, right? Snorkeling. You want to be, like, if, if snorkeling is like awesome fun for you, then you should take a free diving course. If snorkeling terrifies you, you need to conquer snorkeling before you conquer free diving, right? So you just want to be comfortable in the water. Um, you also, depending on where you take the course, I would argue that you want to be comfortable being in the ocean um, and being on boats, right? Because I, I mean, I have some people that come in, they fly in, they spend all this money and they've never been on a boat before. They've never been in the ocean. And I tell them like, that's, you know, you want to be comfortable with all this stuff because I can't control if you're going to get seasick. I, that is completely beyond my ability. And if you get out there and you're seasick, you're going to be miserable, right? So I would say you want to be comfortable in the water, a reasonable amount of, of, of fitness, and you know, have some know that you're going to be comfortable uh, on boats. There are more and more classes in the springs now, which is which is kind of if you're an absolute beginner, a spring course is a really nice alternative because it's in a spring, it's black calm, there's no salt water, no waves, all that stuff. So that's uh, another thing that you can do. So that's basically what I would say from a, a recommendation for what you need before going into the free diving course. Okay, um, we've got another one from Linnea. It's more related to Sherry's story. Um, do you have any advice on how to talk to your free diver friends about safety and especially like in this moment of everything? Cause it's obviously like your story. It is hard to sometimes approach your friends and be like, Hey, we should be doing this. So any, yeah, so, any recommendations? Yeah, so I, I do. So here's what I'll tell you. So one of the, so, I mean, I have been for 10 years saying all of this to the spearfishing community, whether it's in a class or the spearfishing you know, the spearfishing club invites me to go down to Miami and the South Florida free divers, or I've been a speaker at the Florida, uh, I mean, the, the Blue Wild, which is that the largest spearfishing free diving trade show for like seven years. And I always say in the same thing, and I'm always getting the same pushback. Well, I've never had a problem and I don't push myself. And, you know, here's what I'll tell you. I always find it funny. I tell the students, I say, all right, so when you leave me, you know how to do it. You know how it's supposed to be done. You know, it can be done. Now, when you go out on that boat, you are gonna get a sense. You're gonna sense a little bit of my frustration because what's gonna happen is you're gonna go on that boat and say, hey guys, no, I took this freedom glass and we need to blah, blah, blah. We need, no, 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 we gotta be diving safe. They're like, ah, oh, but you know, I've never had a, and I'm like, and when that moment happens, I just gonna laugh at you because now you, you get what I deal with all the time for 10 years, right? So what I will tell you is it's hard. It is hard to convince someone who's done it the other way for 20 years. 
I used to, when I first started teaching free diving, I remember I would, I'd be sitting at the bar and maybe some free diver spear fisherman. And I'm like, Oh, you're, you're free diving, you're spear fish. And I'm like, I'm going to convince this guy to be safe right now. Nope. No, I wasn't right. But I've never had a problem. That's ridiculous. And you know, I, I can't convince them. And then I would get frustrated. And then I would always walk away whenever I walk, you know, I'm frustrated. If you ever hear me say this to someone, I walk away. Well, you know, a nice meeting you. He who, ever, he who lives the longest catches the most fish. See you. I'm out. Right. And so, what I found is I can't convince someone in a five minute conversation. I can't convince someone when they have a whole life experience is the opposite of what I'm saying. Now, I'll tell you how I can convince someone when they're stuck in my house for eight hours and they can't leave, right? And I've got video footage after video after blackout after blackout, and I know how to. Yep. We might, uh, Lost Ted, are you there, Ted? Oh, oh, are you there? Yep. Okay, you froze up there for a second. <laughs> okay. Continue so anyway, on. The, okay. So the short version I was saying is, how do you convince someone? The point is, I know how to do it. So what you, what I recommend is send them to freedivingsafety.com because. It's going to be all the explanations way more in depth than this program. I know a lot of people that own boats that say you have to have taken a course or you have to go to freedivingsafety.com and you have to take a screenshot that you got hundred percent on the quiz, right? Otherwise I'm not diving with you. So the long answer to your question is try to convince them. But if they, if you can't convince them, send them to me, I'm, if I can't convince them, then no one's gonna, right? So that would be my suggestion is use me. I mean, I, you know, that I, for 10 years, I, I've tried to craft an argument to convince people to dive, to dive safely, right? And, you know, get that nice bonus about dying and you get more fish. Um, okay, I've got, we've actually, we've got a lot of questions. Um, from Katie, can you black out at any depth? Yes. So here's the question. So when I, you know, when I start talking about all this stuff in the class and they're watching these videos, these blackouts and you know, and I'm talking about all this stuff and the fatality rates, like I can always see like the, like the desk gets pushed farther away and they're just like, Oh my God, what the hell have I signed up for? Like I maybe, I, you know, and, and, and so here's the thing that I'll, that I'll tell you. And it's about that point they start to ask questions like, well, 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 what, what can I do to like, make sure that I won't black out? Like if I just, you know, I, but I just, I'm only going to dive to 30 feet and I, you know, I only stay down to like, I have a contraction or I only stay down for this many seconds. Right. And, and I always like, that is what they want is they want to, how do I not have to follow all these rules? Right. And unfortunately I don't have an answer to that question. If I could say, if you follow these three rules, you would never black out. I would never teach free diving courses. I would just sell postcards with the rules on them. And it'd be like, all oh, this, and you'd be good. There is no guarantee, right? The only way to guarantee is, is, is stay on the, stay on, stay on, don't go in the water, right? How do I know that? Look at the keys. Every year we find dead free divers in 15 foot of water, right? I mean, so everyone wants to know, well, how can I do it where I don't have to do all this stuff or not be risked? I mean, the idea is when you dive shallow, you stay down longer, right? It's in human nature to dive down as long as you think you can that's what free divers do right um so i would just tell you i wish i had a great answer for that but i mean you know in the keys we find dead dead free divers every year in 15 20 foot of water right um there is no way to guarantee that won't happen right i mean is diving to 100 feet riskier than diving to 15 feet yeah right but do we find dead people in 15 feet yeah right so i would just say ultimately you want to use these free diving procedures every time you're in the water. So here's an example, right? I remember this was years ago, but I was out spearfishing with my girlfriend, Kathy, right? We're in 40 foot of water. My deepest free dive is 280 feet, right? We're in 40 foot of water. Kathy's in the water with me, safety me, because I need a safety. Kathy doesn't care that much about spearfishing. She's got like 20 minutes. She's like, I want to get on the boat. I want to have a beer. I want a sandwich. I'm like, no, 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 come on, come on, come on, come on. Give me, you know, 10 more minutes, like 10 more minutes. And then I'll make you whatever on the egg for dinner. And I'm trying to bribe her for 10 more minutes. But once she's on the boat, I'm on the boat. I'm done, right? I, I know more than anyone the risks. And I'm not going to be like, well, I can dive this deep and it's fine. I mean, as soon as, as, soon as she's on the boat, I, I, I'm on the boat. 
right? So I would just tell you there's, you know, I don't have a good answer to that question. And, and the other thing I just want to make clear is free diving, you know, what, watching this video is great, right? You learn some good stuff. Right, free diving safety, you got even way more stuff, you know, techniques to reduce your likelihood of blackout, how to save your buddy if they have one, all these other things. And that's great, that's even better, right? But nothing is going to, they, these things do not replace taking a free diving class. I, I always say that this is a good eye-opening experience of understanding safety, but ultimately you wanna go take that free diving class where you're actually doing the rescues, right? And you're learning how to do all these techniques, right? You, you don't get CPR certified from watching a CPR video, you gotta go in and actually do it, right? So, you know, I always encourage you, these are not substitutes for classes, they're good information, but ultimately my hope, and people tell me that these, the free diving safety encourages them to go take uh, a, a free diving class. So that's my advice is that, you know, there's no, easy answer to that question. And that's why you just always want to be one up, one down, close enough to grab and have someone watching you for 30 seconds. Gotcha. Um, and just this, this one, I, I have a hunch is probably a, an easy one to answer as a follow-up to that is, can you keep free diving after you rest after a blackout? Or are oh, you done awesome for the question. day? <laughs> awesome, 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 awesome question. So if you had sat through my free diving class and watched all these blackout videos, Right. One of the things that you would see is they when they come to, they're like, you know, they have a problem or they black out and they come to and they're like, Murp. and they're fine. They're like, and typically the first thing they say is, I didn't black out. And they're like, oh yeah, no, I did not feel fine. I remember the whole diet, like I didn't black out. And there's, there's typically an argument over if they blacked out or not, but they feel fine. In fact, I didn't have time. I've actually got another video that I don't think I have time to show you, but um, the person blacked out. My student, uh, that guy hadn't taken the class. My student had taken the class. The student rescued him. The guy refused to believe that he blacked out and continued to die. So ultimately to answer your question, if you have a loss of motor control or if you have a blackout, you are done for the day because when you had that hypoxic issue, you robbed oxygen from all of your stores. You obviously robbed it from your lungs, right? You robbed it from your muscle tissues, your myoglobin. So you can't, even though you might feel fine, you can't just take like a five minute breathe out and be like, right, I'm good, let's go. You're already deficient. And so if you do, you're gonna have a much worse loss of motor control or blackout, right? So funny story, I had a um, Navy SEAL go through the program, right? And I explained to him that if you have a loss of motor control or blackout, you're gonna have a much worse hypoxic outcome. And as soon as I say that, he's in the back right here. <laughs> and I'm like, oh no. I'm like, I, I know exactly what that means, right? Because they have to do underwater swims, right? And they absolutely black out. And so I said, I said, let me guess. If they black out, they got to do it again. And he's like, yep. And I'm like, and they black out. He's like, every time, right? <laughs> so we know for a fact that being hypoxic does make it uh, more likely to have a worse blackout. I, in fact, had a phone call. I had uh, uh, a, a guy, and I remember the name and details, but he was in, 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 in Destin, and he, he was asking all these questions, and I had to put him through free diving safety, and then he's taking all these spear fishermen out, and because he had gone through the course, he actually saved this kid from a blackout, and then he got the kid to call me so we could talk about it, and one of the things, talking between those two, is that the reason that he had that blackout was a couple dives before, he came up and his lips were were white. They're really not blue, but really white, and you know he just wasn't quite right. And so what happened was he had a very mild loss of motor control. He didn't know it, and then he continued diving, and then not surprisingly, he had a much worse. Uh, he had an actual blackout a few dives later. Okay, um, what is the minimum age you'll train? Uh, my minimum age is 16. Most free diving classes do much less than that, uh, 10 to 11, but mine is, is uh, 16. Okay. Um, and I'll also just let you know, just because so, there are going to be a lot of questions about free diving classes. I'm not teaching right now due to the virus. I probably will resume back in May. Um, so I'm not teaching, but there's a lot of, uh, a lot of free diving classes that are going on. Um, okay. But just Good so I know people are start asking, when can I sign up for a class? Okay. Um, uh I have Jeff said, I once got tunnel vision when coming up from a deep dive. Have you heard of this before? Yeah, that's a sign of, that's a lot, the beginning of tunnel vision is absolutely a sign of a loss of motor control. So that is a loss of motor control, oh, right? Excellent. Even though you might not have had the shaker, right? Tunnel vision, you, people see stars, they see uh, perceptual narrowing, tunnel vision, stars, squiggly lines, all that sort of stuff is absolutely signs. Um, so I, 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 had the, I had a loss of motor control. I was a dive instructor at Telvin's and I I was starting to get into free diving, right? And uh, I could free dive down to the top deck of the Thunderbolt, 
right? And you know, I thought I was super cool because I would I would free dive down to when I when I'd team up there and I'd go up to him and I'd be like, your air pressure, and I would look at the air pressure. Like, You're okay, right? I said, your air pressure, right? And I'd look at it. You're okay. I remember I checked these two guys' air pressure. There was a third one about 15, 20 foot away, and I was about to go check this. I'm like, yeah, I'm kind of deep. Like I probably shouldn't do that. And I free dive at the surface before I did the free diving class. I didn't know squat about free diving. I hit the surface. I did a couple of breaths, and immediately I feel this like for like a millisecond, this like electric shock run through my body. I mean, it felt like I touched like the light socket for like, I mean, a millisecond. And then I f- felt fine. And I was like, something's happened? Like, and then I'm like, I thought something just happened, but I, 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 I'm fine. And then I was like, ah, well, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was a double tank trip and I had to load twice as many tanks. And so I didn't have time to eat breakfast. I probably just got low blood sugar. And I just totally dis- dismissed it and went on the boat. And about a year later, I took a free diving class and they're like, oh, that was a loss of motor control. So let's look at the safety procedures I had on that dive, right? So I was free diving. Was it by myself? Absolutely, right? Absolutely, I was by myself. The captain was watching me. The captain was watching me, right? <laughs> Secondly, I was absurdly overweighted. I, was, I used to overweight myself because I'm like, it makes it so simple to get down, right? And I'm a free diving. I'm a scuba driver. I got big, strong legs. So I, can the, I was totally overweighted. I was by myself. So on that dive, I checked two people's air pressure. If I had decided to check that third person's air pressure, what would have happened is I would have dove up to the surface, I would have taken a couple of breaths, I would have blacked out. There was no one there, there. I would have sunk down to the bottom, I would have landed on the deck of that Thunderbolt, and one of those poor customers would have likely bent themselves trying to get me to the surface and it wouldn't have made a difference anyway, right? So. Oh, oh goodness. Okay, um, from Ralph, what are some good breathing techniques before free diving? So the, the biggest thing is you want to slow, you want to be, you want to slow your breathing down, right? We want to be, con- it's, it's not so much about what it is that you're doing, it's just that you're conscious of your breathing and it's very slow. We want to avoid <laughs> hyperventilating, right? Now the problem with hyperventilating, <laughs> well, so hyperventilating, the reason people do it is it works. Right, so I remember when I started at the, the Keys, and I remember I would talk to these free divers, and I'm like, man, I, I can't say that more than like 20 seconds. I feel like I'm gonna die, right? And and they're like, oh, well, you just gotta hyperventilate it because it's your carbon dioxide level, and it changes and it moves, you know, and it sounds all super scientific. I'm like, okay, well, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do it, right? So now, I'm, and I dive down, and now instead of staying for 20 seconds, I can stay down for like 35, 40 seconds. I'm like, wow, it's hyperventilation. That's how you do it, right? And without getting into the physics and physiology of it. What hyperventilation does is it's altering your blood chemistry, and it does two things. Number one, it delays your urge to breathe. That's why I was able to stay down longer. That's why people do it. The second thing it does is it physically reduces the amount of oxygen available to your body. Can you understand that's a very bad combination? It lets you stay down longer, and it gives you less oxygen. That's why it absolutely increases the risk of blackout, right? And that's why it's so dangerous, right? That's why we don't want to be not like I used to do when I started, right? We don't want to be hyperventilating. We just want to take slow, relaxed breaths, right? Okay. Um, I've got two more. Is high intensity cardio a good way to increase my static breath hold? I would say no. I would say specific free diving training is going to increase your, your performance, right? I mean, it all, it, it all depends. You look at most free divers, you know, they're gonna tell you no, because, because it, that, what that does is it increases your metabolism, right? It increases your metabolism, which makes everything rev higher, right? So, the best way to increase your freediving performance is do freediving specific drills. So like the thing I always tell like spear fishermen, spear fishermen are super dedicated to their sport, right? They spend so much time, energy, money, effort. And then I ask them like, so what do you do to train? They're like, train? I'm like, yeah, what do you do to train for your sport? And they're like, well, I go spear fishing whenever I can, right? Okay, ask a football player, what do you do to train for football? They don't just say, well, I play football. They go, I play football and then I go to the gym and then I do cardio and then I do stretching and then I do interval training. They do all these different things. Right, so for free diving, that's what my 28 day program is. It is free diving specific 
exercises, right? I mean, I joke, I have a body built by beer, bourbon, and barbecue. There's nothing special about me. The fact that I can free dive, that I freed up to 279 feet and I held my breath for seven minutes. You know, I'm always trying to tell my students, if I could be good at free diving, there's no reason you couldn't be. Almost all of my students are in better shape than me. They're better athletes than me, lower body fat than me. They're better athletes than me every way that I can free dive circles around them. Why? Because I know how to do very specific free diving training, right? And that's what's in the 20 day program. And, you know, in that 20 day program, I'm not telling you to do high intensity cardio, <laughs> right? Okay. I'm going to give you the specific things that you want to be doing, right? But any kind of breath hold training is going to be better than doing high end cardio, in my opinion. Okay. And then for the last one I have, is there a difference in free diving for length of time underwater as opposed to depth? In other words, my interest is in is more in staying below longer in a shallow depth rather than going deep. No, it's all it's it's all the same, right? I mean, as far as the way that you do it is the same. The safety principles are the same. Oddly enough, so spear fishermen, which is typically who I deal with, you know, they say they want to dive deeper, but but ultimately, what'll make you more have more performance, whether you're a spear fisherman or you're a photographer, or you just like being underwater, is you want to extend your time underwater, right? Certainly if you're a spear fisherman, if you can add on 10, 15, 20 seconds, you're going to be more productive, right? Oddly enough, one of the best ways to achieve that increase in time is through depth training, right? Because when you start learning to dive deep, your body is getting adjusted to what it's like deep. But then when you're in these shallow depths, you're like, oh, this is nothing. I feel like awesome. I feel no urge to breathe at all, right? And again, one of the ways that you can simulate that kind of depth is through specific free diving training exercise, the, the free diving stretches, which I teach in the 28 day program that is designed to increase, it, it basically it's designing to teaching you to treat your body, get it as if it's underwater, even though you're on dry land, diaphragm stretching, all these things, right? That simulate depth that give you that result. But, you know, I, I would say that free diving training in general is going to help either one, but believe it or not, actually going in the water and diving deep is, is an excellent way to increase your time in the, in the shallower water. All right. Well, those were the, the questions I had, unless we have anyone else trying to sneak one in while we wrap up here for a minute. Um, so if you do have any more questions, you know, send them to me right now and I'll, I'll field them off. Um, Lisa, do you have any, any words? Well, two things. One is I would like to, again, thank our sponsor, the Misu family for tonight. I'd like to thank Ted for his time and his information. Um, I know I'm basically a scuba diver, but I did take the uh, free diving one class some years ago with Martin and um, yeah. I'm so thankful for it because the things that you learn, the safety, the um, breathing exercises, everything, it just, it makes you more comfortable whether you're snorkeling or free diving. I'm not a, I'm not a spear fisherman, but it helps me just enjoy the water, those shallow reefs come and seeing stuff. So I uh, thank you for all the information. I love your website your uh, freedivingsafety.com. As a thank you, the History of Diving Museum will be sending you a wonderful shirt like this. And Excellent. you will be a uh, card carrying member of the History of Diving Museum for 362 Excellent. days. Excellent. <laughs> so um, thank, you. Awesome. thank you. Thank you for helping us with our yeah. free diving exhibit. We encourage all the participants to come down and see that, see um, Ted's equipment on display and uh, visit the History of Diving Museum. We also, reminder, we have the Patty Women's Dive Day on Saturday and Sunday. Check our website for more information. That's it from me. Back to you, Emily. Um, I, I got, of course I opened the floodgates for that. Um, <laughs> so can you scuba dive and free dive in the same day? Oh, awesome good question. question. Awesome question. Okay, so uh, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. So let me explain why. Okay, I know of scuba instructors that have bent themselves free diving. Here's why. You're a scuba diver, right? And this is a scuba instructor, so super good diver, right? So he goes down on deep wreck, does, you know, he's on, you know, I think it was Dwayne, but he's doing a 100 foot dive. 
and he comes up. So let me ask you a question. As a scuba diver, are you supposed to come up slow or fast? Slow, slow. right? Slow is your slowest bow. Slow is the, what your diving computer says. So he goes up super slow. Right? And then he gets to 15 feet. What is he supposed to do there? Safety stop for three to five minutes, which he does because he's a scuba instructor. He does everything that he's doing. And he gets in the boat. And he gets in the boat. He takes his gear off, puts his free diving fins on, and says, watch this. Right? So here's the question. When he takes that BC off, does all the nitrogen in his body like magically pop out of his body and go to his BC and regulator? No, all that nitrogen's still in there, right? So now he free dives down and he touches the deck. Now he comes up. He's a free diver. Does he come up fast or slow? Fast, because he's a free diver, right? So he's up to the surface, right? When he gets to the 15 foot mark, what does he do? He goes flying right by, right? So when you think about it that way, can you see why that is a problem, right? That's basically no different than him putting the scuba gear on and doing that, right? Like, oh, no, 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 don't, 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 don't. That's you get bent. You can't do that, right? So free diving after scuba is asking to get bent. You're just asking for it. And I know people got bent just that way, okay? So that is a huge no-no. So now when I tell that in class, inevitably I always get this question. I wait for it. Eventually someone goes, whoop. What about, what about if I go free diving first and then I go scuba diving? Still bad, not as bad, absolutely it's not as bad, but here's the problem, right? Free divers do get bent. Believe it or not, free divers do get bent. They always said free divers couldn't get bent and then Kirk, the head of performance free diving got bent. And then there, he was like, huh, I guess we should look into this, right? So free divers can get bent, it's kind of a complicated thing. I don't have time to go into all the details. I just wanna answer your particular question, but free divers do get bent. We do absorb nitrogen, it's just complicated. Uh, works. So what I can tell you is if you go free diving for 40 minutes and you're at like 60 feet and then you go over to another spot and you're free diving at 40 feet for an hour and then you go scuba diving, the question is how much nitrogen's in your body? I don't know. Your dive computer doesn't know. Dan doesn't know. The tables don't know. So you have no way to adjust what you're going to do for that next dive. And I have people saying, well, if I go free diving first, I just take a couple minutes off my time. Oh, three minutes. You take three minutes off your time. Where'd you pull that number from? I know where, because you, no you have no idea, right? So we have no good way to account for it. That's why we recommend free diving one day, scuba on the other. I hate that, right? Because I remember there was time I was at the, uh, when I was at the Vandenberg, so there's a really cool video you guys should check out defending the Vandenberg. Uh, anyway, and I, it was a really cool free diving video we did on it. And then I got to go visit on a liver board and I was so frustrated because I knew I could only free dive it or scuba dive because I couldn't, I couldn't do both, right? So basically free diving after scuba, Big no-no. Um, free diving first and then scuba diving is still a problem, not as bad, but it still is a problem. So we recommend do two separate days. I know that as a, when I was a, took a free diving class and I worked on a dive boat, I would go dive the Thunderbolt and then I would occasionally have to go do some free diving thing for the, the boat or someone's trying to get something. And, and so knowing what I knew, like if a customer dropped something overboard, I would free dive down to get it. But then I would flare my fins out and make a scuba speed ascent, right? If I had to, and obviously I wouldn't, I don't normally do that, but if I'm working on the dive shop, I had to, but that's what I would do. But basically the short answer to your question is the best way to do it is separate days and what we recommend. Okay, well, that was the, the last one I had, Ted. So I think we're gonna, we're gonna wrap it up. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, I will have a YouTube link that I'll send you to share with your folks. Um, and if anyone else wants to either watch this again, or if you came in late, I can send it to you through email as well. And I know I've had a lot of other people say thank you also for, for doing this presentation with us. And everyone loved it so much. So thank you, Ted, for this. And we'll, we'll be in touch soon and, and hope you, know, you stay well and everyone else does as well. Yep, absolutely. Well, certainly happy to do it. I love sharing safety and trying to get people, convince them to, to be safer divers. I always say people, dive safe out there. It's not even that hard, right? Now you've got some more information to do that. Exactly. Well, cool. So I'm going to sign everyone off and we next month, like we said, we're going to be talking about some military diving and everything. So stay tuned for that and we will see you soon. All right. Thanks so much. All right. Bye guys. <laughs>